Welcome back in everybody. We are gonna talk about a lot of different things today, so I will try to timestamp it down below for you. But first and foremost, let's talk about the two main things that we've been focused on on the channel. Now that's gonna be GARP, growth at a reasonable price, and flywheel business models. And so one of the stocks we were talking about on the channel was Gen Digital. This is a name that most people probably don't know, but, but I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of their products like LifeLock, Avast, and Norton. We use a lot of these products for cybersecurity, identity, identity protection, and I definitely think there is a high need for this, especially the more that AI rolls out here. And we're gonna have a hard time telling between what is real and what is fake. And so I thought that this company was positioned pretty well some of the stocks that i've been talking about and have been massive outperformers over the last three to four months i would say and gen digital was definitely one that reported strong earnings and forward guidance and when we look at garp growth at a reasonable price this stock was trading right around eight times earnings was projected to grow anywhere between five to ten percent depending on who you're looking at and the total addressable market here was starting to expand out because we're starting to see more and more cyber attacks take place so when we look at garp or growth at a reasonable price the first thing we want to think about is what is the valuation of the company compared to its peers and what is its growth rate compared to its peers because if we can find companies that are trading below market multiples compared to its peers but have above average growth compared to its peers probably going to have a pretty good price discovery take place with that company and so i'm just using gen digital as an example but it was pretty much in a sweet spot of having a pe ratio of roughly eight times earnings and i thought it had the ability to grow consistently between five percent to eight percent over the next foreseeable future. And so this is definitely a sweet spot when we can find a company that maybe is trading at 20 times earnings, that's growing at 20% or maybe even 25%. And it has that ability to keep growing at that rate. But along with that, what we want is we want that flywheel experience, that flywheel business model to go with it. And how this works is the first thing is you want the ability to attract in the customers, something that's appealing, something that's engaging, something that's going to force them to go in and bring their attention to your business. And that's the first line of defense when we think about flywheel. The second step is to engage the customer, have them be able to understand the product very easily, be able to customize this product. And within doing so, making this process easy, simple, and customizable will allow not only the engagement to be at a high rate, but will allow multiple buys of this product and or service that you're offering. And lastly is delight. This once again is just making it simple, clean, understanding the customer's feedback so you can stay ahead of the competitors. And the customer experience is the most important thing. Now here's where, now here's where I think you can draw the line. When you go through the second stage of engagement, I think you want companies that offer multiple products here that can sell the customer in multiple ways. And when we look at Gen Digital, that definitely falls in the line. When we think about Apple, that absolutely falls in line. You got the hardware aspect of the business, whether it's the phones that link to the computers and make everything a simple process. But then you also have the programs to go along with it that now cause that now is a service fee to go with that. So the engagement on the Apple products really fits into a flywheel experience. And that's why Apple is extremely successful. And when we think about a lot of your big mega tech companies, very, very similar opportunities. And so these smaller companies that are kind of getting overlooked, what you want to do is you want to look at these companies and say, do they have GARP? Are they growth at a reasonable price? Do they have a flywheel business model here where they are listening to the customer? They're being innovative. They have multiple ways to engage the customer and that customer can have the opportunity to engage in that platform for a long period of time and have multiple buys on that product and or service. And so that's where you really want to focus in on to be able to kind of outpace the market here. And so two companies I really want to bring up here that are kind of hitting on the flywheel, but not quite 100%. I normally, normally hate consumer discretionary restaurant side of the sector here. And when we look at a company like Chipotle, who's been just a massive outperformer here and what makes them so special? Well, let's think about it. Some of the flywheel things that we did talk about is what makes them special. And we can see that the chart here is just going in a perfect 45 degree angle from left to right. Number one is they make multiple transactions very, very quick. When we think about the sit down traditional restaurants, the problem is people sit there for a while, they eat their dinner and it's one transaction that's taking place. With a company like Chipotle and McDonald's and even Starbucks, what do we notice with them? High volume, high turnover rates, multiple purchases usually taking place. And while the transactions are a lot less than maybe a sit down restaurant, because they're able to make so many transactions, whether that's through the drive-through and or through the store itself, 
those transactions make up for the lost expense of the total bill and end up outperforming longer term over the restaurants because margins are better and because transactions are happening at a faster rate. And so Chipotle does find that sweet spot of they are customizable. Think about how customizable Chipotle is. You go in line, you pick exactly what you want, and you're pretty much making it as if you were cooking it yourself. And so what was one of the things on the flywheel? The ability to understand the business, the ability to customize the product, and that's exactly what you're able to do with a company like Chipotle and a company like Starbucks. And when we think about the business model of those two companies, they've been pretty massive outperformers. Now I'm gonna to get to my point here. Now the biggest problem I personally had with Chipotle was the fact that the valuation to me it seems extremely high here. This is a company that doesn't do a tremendous amount of free cash flow. Most food companies are very, very low free cash flows, very low operating margins. And so Chipotle does have better margins than its competitors. And so when we think about a shift in the consumer, while the price point of Chipotle is pretty strong, I think they'll probably perform well even in a recession. And that's probably why we see this trade for a high multiple, but that high multiple, I just can't get behind. And so Kava did report earnings, and this is a company I've kind of been keeping an eye on. When it first IPO'd, I just thought it was stupid that it shot up to $58 a share, but now that it's trading between $29 and $35, I, I'm actually starting to find this one pretty interesting from a valuation standpoint. Now, if you're not familiar with Kava, definitely a fast growing business here, and very similar to a Chipotle setup, but it's Mediterranean style here. So that gives you a different variety versus the Mexican style. So we look at cash and cash equivalent, going from 340 million from 39 million good strong good strong top line revenue growth going from 434 million in top line revenue to 551 million in 40 weeks ended so when we bring it down to a net income they were losing 40 million dollars in the 40 weeks ended now making 11.2 million and quarter over quarter they were losing nearly 12 million and now they're making nearly 7 million so we're starting to see this company now get to an interesting point here where the earnings per share are actually positive. We can see the proceeds of 342 million from the initial public offering. So in the promotional pieces, what we're seeing is they had 11 net new Kava restaurants open for the quarter. Kava revenue growth was 49.5% year over year with same sales growth at 14%, which is very, very strong same store growth here. Projecting out new restaurant openings to be 70 to 73 new store openings and adjust Adjusted EBITDA to go up. So a lot, a lot of good news here, definitely for the company. But with these younger companies, the one thing you're definitely going to have to watch out for is how do they raise capital here? And it's probably going to be share issuance. I definitely don't think they want to go to the traditional debt market right now with, with where interest rates are. And most of these businesses are fairly lower margin type businesses, even though they are getting some sort of margin expansion here. When we look at forecast, we have everything from $35 to $58. Obviously, we're seeing a trade down today at $31. So could be some opportunity here. When we look at stock analysis, basically growing right around 20% in the foreseeable future here. I think that's realistic, especially with the amount of stores that they're opening up. I actually think they can well outperform that. And they're already outperforming the EPS side of things. They're already doing 26 cents a share. And by the end of 2023, it should be over that. And Stock analysis has them doing six cents. So for them to do two cents in 2024, that could be capital expenditures really taking away from their earnings per share. But from that point on, I'm imagining that they will get some things right here. So I have them growing 20%, 12%, and 6%. You know, I think when we look at what free cash flow is going to be for the company, I tend to think that it's going to be fairly low over the short I tend to think it's going to be fairly low over the next 10 to 15 years until they become much more of a mature company and stop the capital expenditures on growth and they expand those margins. So I'm going to err on caution from a free cash flow standpoint from a multiple to EV to EBITDA. Let's take a look at what the valuation is at right. Currently see it trading at a 94 times multiple of EV to EBITDA versus industry standard of 10 times. This is pretty normal to see with growth companies that are brand new to the market. And so what we have to figure out is what is the right multiple to put on the stock? And if we look at Chipotle's multiple comparison to Chipotle at this point in time, but Chipotle is trading at 30 times while industry standard is trading at 10 times. So here's the issue I'm having. We can see the growth of Kava stores here. They're pushing over 260 stores currently, and they're going to add an additional 70 to 73 stores. The Aaron Caution say they only opened 65 stores in 2024. I had to buy the 265 roughly stores that they have out there. That's nearly a 24% increase in stores, along with 15% revenue increase on same store on same store sales. So, you know, I really think that they are going to do closer to 22% 
revenue growth and probably high teens growth from there on. Um, but I hate building too much growth into a stock because we all know that this could shift really quick. The market can turn and they could all of a sudden not be opening nearly as many stores. Using 20% growth rates, 12% growth rates, and 6% growth rates, getting a 12% compounded rate of return, I need to buy the stock around $16 a share in, with a fair market value of 2031 by 20, with a fair market value of 2031 being $21. Now, personally, I really think that they can grow a lot faster than that when we're looking at what they're projecting out here. If they can maintain same store sales growth growing in the teens are, and then they are pushing out 70, 80 stores a year, I definitely think a growth rate of 25% in the next few years makes a lot of sense because we're just seeing right now that they're projecting to grow their store count by 25% alone. So that in itself should impact top revenue a substantial amount here. And if we project out that they start slowing down from years three through six, they do 18% and then year six through 10, they do 10%. I really think this is fairly achievable here. And when we look at the revenue growth, I don't think it's outrageous that they're doing $1.2 billion by 2025 because they're gonna be pushing 800, they're gonna be pushing anywhere between 750 to 800 million by 2023. I tend to think that these growth rates are actually really doable here. And if we look at this, a fair market price on the stock is sitting now around 22 to about $25 a share with a fair market price of 2031 being around $31 a share. And I think this is actually achievable. This gives it around an $8 billion market cap. As always, really appreciate everybody's time and we will see you in the next one.